Next up on our virtual stage is Anne-Marie Naylor joining us from the UK. Hi, Anne-Marie. Um, Anne-Marie is the Director of Policy and Strategy at, at Future Care Capital, a national charity that uses the insight gathered through evidence-based research to advance ideas and that wants to shape future health and social care policy with better outcomes for society. She has a background in public policy, working with local, regional and central government in the UK and was awarded an, awarded an MBE for services to community asset ownership in 2015. And we're now going to listen to her talk about honesty in uncertain times. And as always, you can turn to the chat for asking questions and interacting with her. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Hi, everybody. And thank you very much for involving me in what's a terrific event this afternoon. Um, so having been introduced so well, I will skip to my second slide and say that what matters now to me is honesty in uncertain times. And if I'm honest, I feel a little bit like Eeyore, and I have been for at least the last six months in repeatedly kind of trying to do the thing that uh, I'm supposed to do and facing uh, kind of changes in the landscape that undermine or feel like they undermine sometimes a lot of the work that we've tried to do in good faith for the last three years. So I want to start by saying the Eeyore I hope will change to something more positive by the end. This uh, slide is really about saying to you that for me the last three years has been about promoting trust and trustworthiness predominantly in the use of health and care data to try to uh, improve outcomes for individuals, uh, whether they may be from vulnerable groups and in need of uh, regular care because they're elderly, because they're frail or because they're unwell. And all of a sudden with the pandemic, everybody it seems is faced with the prospect of becoming unwell. And worse than that, the prospect potentially of, of losing their life. And I don't think we've been honest and had a conversation about death. So in the UK instead and around the world, this is the first data driven pandemic. And so instead of talking about people and instead of talking about life and death, it feels like we've been bombarded by, uh, by waves of charts and flattening curves and diagrams and numbers and statistics. Many of which it has to be said uh, in terms of my day job uh, have been found wanting repeatedly. And the most recent in the United Kingdom example uh, from the late, last week would be that we appear to have lost 2.4 million test results out of 10.5 million tests that we know we've undertaken or at least issued. How are we going to get back, uh, take back control using the data being led by the science or guided by the science um, if the numbers aren't reliable, if the numbers aren't there? It seems to me we need to be honest about this. We need though to also acknowledge that this is really difficult that the science is new, the disease is new, the virus. We, there's so much we don't know that we're finding out day by day. And so numbers can't be perennially reliable and something that we can base our decisions upon. And yet we've tried. And in the process of that, what I think we've seen through Black Lives Matters and through uh, other kind of highlighted inequalities in previous talks this afternoon, is that difference um, has kind of been overlooked or because at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a sense of level, it was a great leveler that everybody was in the same boat and could be at equal risk. And what we know now is that that is absolutely not true. And to give voice to someone whose voice uh, warrants hearing more than mine, in the last six weeks, I've had the privilege of working with the Health Foundation in the United Kingdom, uh, engaging people who are in receipt of social care and who try to provide care services across the country. And in the context of those discussions, a gentleman, a wheelchair user talked to us and, an, and a political activist and told us that he had suddenly received a food parcel in good faith on the part of the government from a supermarket who must have received his details, his contact details, his address and so forth, his preferences and requirements. He'd never consented, he'd never been asked. How do we make sure that what we do is not count numbers, put people on a list without them knowing and feeling uninvolved in the kind of process in which their you know, life critical matters there are caught up. We've consistently called for what we call data that cares with that in mind. Um, and I feel like recently that's absolutely what hasn't happened. So we are, people will be aware we have lost a, a disproportionate number of people very tragically in receipt of care in residential care settings as people have I know around the world in the US in Europe and, and in Canada. Uh, and what we need going forward is a way that we can count people that doesn't do damage to the differences between them, uh, to their life experiences, to their quality of life that means it's worthwhile living in the first place. 
we need to understand and hear their experiences and we need to have some way to capture that so that the science doesn't take over and do damage to what, what is after all life and very messy and complicated. So what I'd like to say at the end is to say, we need some more of this because it's been a long six months and Tigger is my kind of mascot here and we need courage. And if we can take heart in anything, it's that there has been appalling use of war rhetoric and the language of battling invisible enemies, which is all very masculine in my view and un unhelpful uh, in so many regards. And I don't think what we need is more talk of war, but if there is one bit of positive to take from that is that in all wars invariably our ability to treat people from the point of view of developing our health services and our science always move on leaps and bounds. This is a brilliant opportunity for that to happen again. Thank you. <laughs>